Are you excited to be in God's house? Make some noise. Amen. Welcome everyone joining us online or outside in our courtyard. So glad you're here with us today for part two of the blessed life. Now we all want that. We all want to be blessed by God and we want to bless life, but it is possible that your definition of what to be blessed or a blessed life is might be different than what God says a blessed life is or even what equals a blessed life. So in this series, what I'm doing is kind of dissecting the word of God together to see what God says according to his kingdom equals the blessed life and try to organize and structure our life in such a way that we are blessed by God, not necessarily by man or this world because they can have it. I want to be blessed by God. Amen, somebody? So, so last week we went over this, this harvest principle, the laws of the harvest. You may have even heard about sowing and reaping um, uh, this principle, but we actually studied this. It was very theological, kind of Bible study last week. Today's going to be similar. We're going to dig into a topic and study the Word of God together. Before I tell you where we're going, let me give you two verses. Matthew 6, 33. Go to your notes with me, or it's up here on the screen. Jesus says, but first, someone say, but first. I love the Amplified version of this because the Amplified Bible takes like these key words in the, in, the, in the scripture and then it pulls out all the meaning and the richness of that word in the actual original language. So this is what Jesus says, but first, say it again. And most importantly, he says seek, which means to aim at or strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, which means his way of doing and being right or the attitude and character of God. And when you do that, when you put that first, him first, all these things will be given to you also. In other words, God's priorities, listen, must become our priorities if we wanna live the blessed life. When we put God first in our lives, listen, everything comes to order. I'm not saying you're not gonna have problems, you're not gonna have issues, but I am saying everything comes to order when God is first. Now look at Luke chapter nine with me. One person said to Jesus, I'll follow you, Lord, but first. Somebody say, but first. But first, let me go back and take care of some things. Man, I just got some things. Have you ever had a but first moment with God? Where you're like, like, I'll join the groups, but first, man. I'll get baptized, Jesus, but, but first, but first. I mean, I love to, I'm gonna study my Bible, but first, let me just check my emails real quick. Let me see what's going on in my stories real quick. We've all had these but first moments. Jesus says, but first seek me, and we come up with, but first, let me take care of this. And this man here gives Jesus a but first. Let me go back and say goodbye to my family, and here's how Jesus responds. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. So here's the kicker. The direction of your life is determined by the priorities of your heart. We've all had these but first moments and the world is full of but first. And they often, listen to me, they often pull us away from the best things that God has to offer us and what matters most. So here's what we're gonna talk about, this one truth. The order of your priorities determines the outcome of your life. Now, if you wanna live the blessed life, Here's, a, you, your life must reflect God's kingdom order. There is an order to our life that must be reflected if we want to be blessed by God, which leads us to the message title today, but first. Someone say, but first. Putting God in his rightful place because God can take no other place in your life, but first. Come on, somebody say, but first. Jesus' call to follow him isn't about your performance, church. It's about your priorities. He's, he's, not, he's not like, like no, 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 he doesn't, it's not about what you're doing and not doing as much as who is on the throne of your life. But first, some of y'all need to shift your butts. You're telling, you're telling God, but first I gotta do these things and you need to tell everything you gotta do, but first I need to get with God. Oh man, I'm preaching better than you responded again. Okay, now if you wanna access the blessed life, and this is what I'm doing in this series, I'm just taking what, the, what God's word says, equals the blessed life, and I'm gonna teach it to you. We've got two more topics that are really important, but today is extremely important as well. Last week, the law of harvest. You gotta understand sowing and reaping. You have to understand if you wanna be blessed by God, you have to understand the kingdom principle of sowing and reaping. Today, I'm gonna give you five things, five, five areas of your life that you need to put God first in, and then there's one of them specifically that all throughout the Bible tells us when you do, it actually equals 
a blessing upon your life. So let me give you the five areas that your life, you want the blessed life, you gotta put God first, okay? Put God in his rightful place. Number one, if you want the blessed life, write this down, you gotta put God first in your schedule. In your schedule. How you spend your time reveals who's first in your life. And if God isn't first in your schedule, he'll never be first in your life. Psalm chapter five, verse three. In the morning, O Lord, David says, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you. So let me ask a question. Does your schedule reflect that God is first in your life? If we're honest, many of us are overscheduled. We're overloaded with activity. You have no margin in your life for when God actually comes into your life, taps you on the shoulder and says, I got something for you, son. Hey, I got something for you. Your first response is not joy. Your first response is, oh, dang, there's another thing for me to do. I can't handle another thing for me to do because you filled your life with a whole bunch of things that don't matter when God actually comes in your life and gives you something that's supposed to be a blessing in your life. You can't even receive the blessing because you don't have your life in order. You gotta, if you want to live a blessed life, you need to put God first in your schedule. The second thing, if you want to live a blessed life, number two, you got to put God first in your interests. Your interests. God wants to be in your life, not just at your church. Come on, somebody. Make him first. But you invite him into everything you do. Whatever you're interested in, I promise you, God wants to be involved in. He's not, he's not mad at He wants to be involved in your interests. Look what 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, like whatever, whatever you do, anything that you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's not just talking about church stuff. That's talking about your hobbies there. That's talking about your passions and your work, everything. God cares about what you're interested in, and he wants to be involved. But here's the key. Your interests are either platforms or distractions in your life. They're either opportunities to glorify God, or they will become things that will pull your attention away from him. So I want you to ask yourself today, is what I'm passionate about drawing me to God, or is it pulling me away from God? Because you may be passionate about fitness, or art, or music, or sports, or cooking, whatever, that's great. God isn't just your Sunday God. He wants to be your Monday through Saturday God as well. He wants you to honor him in your passions, to make those things platforms to reflect his glory and his goodness. So if you love fitness, you can encourage others in their health while pointing them to the creator of their bodies, which is what a lot of people do. Actually, there's a group for that here, a few groups here at Discovery that actually do that. Maybe you love music. Could you use your talents to serve others, glorify God, and lift them up? Absolutely you can. If you're passionate about your work, could you approach every task with excellence like you're serving God and not your boss? Absolutely. Whatever you're, when God's glory is your goal, your interests become his opportunities. Wouldn't you love for God to get involved about what you're passionate about? Look, we, we, he'll start getting involved in blessing your passions when you put them first there. You put God first in your passions because it's not about what you're doing. It's about who you're doing it for. The third area, third area, God says put him first. Number three, put God first in my relationships, in my relationships. If you want to put God first, you got to choose your friends carefully, don't you? Hey, those closest to you, your closest relationships should be pulling you towards God, not drawing you away from him. John chapter 13, Jesus says, a new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone's going to know that who you are. They're going to know you're my disciples if you love one another. So here's the truth. How you love is a reflection of how much you allow God to love you. When God is first in your life, his love overflows into your relationships and it transforms how you treat people. You can't claim to have a thriving relationship with God and have broken, bitter relationships with people. Healthy relationships, they don't happen by accident. They happen when God is at the center. Come on, you want a, God, you want a blessed life, you guys? We've got to put God first then in all these areas. Here's number four. Put God first in your troubles. In your troubles, okay, when, when, when you face unexpected problems, there's pressures that come up in your life. You got a crisis. Who do you turn to? Where do you go first? God says, turn to me when you got a problem. Like before you talk to your friend, before you call your mom or dad, before you talk to the counselor, talk to God. He cares about you. 
Psalm 50, verse 15 says, And call upon me, God says, in your day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. God says you honor me by putting me first when you're in trouble. That's how you honor me. When I'm first, when you're in trouble, when I'm first in the crisis, on the first phone call, that's how you honor me. You put God first in your trouble. Number five, if you want the blessed life, you got to put God first in your finances. Come on, write that down and don't check out on me. Because some of y'all heard this message before. You're like, I heard this before. It's time to check out of this part. You know, my wife, let me give you a little example about this. Because my wife and I, we like to, my whole family, we like to watch movies. Um, we enjoy watching movies. But I don't know if you notice this, now, notice this nowadays. That these new movies that are out, they all have like an agenda. Do you know what I'm talking about? They all got this hidden agenda that ain't too hidden. I'm like watching a movie, getting into it, and then the agenda emerges. I'm like, I don't even want to watch this thing no more. Dang it. You know, and I'm like, now I'm invested in this thing, and I want to see how it ends, though. And I'm like, oh. So we just, we kind of stopped watching new movies, because every, especially by certain companies. But anyway, I'm just like, I'm tired of being agendized. You know what I mean? I don't want to hear, can you just... So I'm like, I'm watching old stuff now. We watch, we watch the reruns. We watch the classics. We watch 10, 20, 30-year-old movies and stuff. I'm like, back to the future and old Star Wars stuff. I'm like, I already watched this stuff with my family. And I'm like, but here's the deal. I've seen this stuff a lot, you guys. And I come to a scene, I'm like, where'd this come from? Did it, when this scene, this is, was this an added scene or something? And, and it's something new that I didn't catch before, but I've watched it so much. Because I'm, I'm telling you this because I want you to be open to the Word of God today. Because maybe there's something new about a message or a topic that you have heard before that God actually wants to reveal something to you today. How many of you believe that God could do that? Especially when you approach God's Word. God can reveal to you something brand new from a word, a, a scripture that you've seen a hundred times. Matthew 6, 21, I shared this with you last week. Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, here's why you need to put him first, and God wants to be first, because that's where your heart's going to be. He knows that there is a string from your heart attached to the treasures, and if he can get your treasures, he gets your heart. When you put God first in your finances, the Bible calls that the tithe or the first fruits, if you're reading the Old Testament, the tithe or the first fruits. What is the tithe and the first fruits? Deuteronomy chapter 14, 23 tells us this. The purpose, God's purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God what? First, that's what he wants. That's what he wants in your life. That's, that's all he wants. It's the only place he can take is the throne of your life. There's no other place but first. So the tithe is his way, his purpose in it is to teach you to put him first in your lives. Now, a lot of times we hear about finances and giving, and it's like, hey, it'll come back to you and stuff. That's all good and biblical and stuff, but I think, write this down somewhere. Tithing was never supposed to be about you getting more. It's always about giving God honor. It's always about honor. So what is the tithe? What is the tithe? This is my theological part, study part of this. We need to dig into this and understand this biblically. And I'm going to help you all understand. Anyone have questions about this? Because some of you love God, you tithe, but you don't have understanding about it. And I'm going to give you some understanding today. The word tithe, it's, it comes from this root Hebrew word that means a tenth or a tithe. Let me give you some scriptures with this. Malachi chapter 3. Let's start here. And I'm going to dissect this with you. We're going to go slow through this. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. It says, For I am the Lord... I do not change. Right off the bat, we're starting off with the immutability of God. That's what this is, the immutability of God, which is a theological concept that means God cannot change. He is immutable. God cannot change because to change would mean he can get better or improve, and God can't get better or improve because God is perfect, therefore he cannot change. Okay, I just need you to see this. I want you to know that this is the God who this scripture is going to be talking about tithing. This is the God who's talking about tithing. He's a God who can't change. Okay, a man didn't say this or start this. By the way, I'm going to show you today that 500 years before the law, the tithe was there. 2,500 years before the law, the tithe was practiced. We see it show up in the life of Cain and Abel. I can even give you an analogy out of the Garden of Eden. God says, out of all my trees, you can have, but that one is mine. You don't touch that one. What God was saying is, you can have all of this, I've given it to you, but the tenth one is mine. That part is a portion for me, okay? So I am the Lord, I do not change. How many of you agree with that? God can't change, okay? He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Okay, so if you believe that, then stop saying, oh, that's Old Testament. Oh, that's under, that's under the law. 
Because you know what else is under the law? Murder. Murder. So, so you believe, do you believe that now because you're under grace that you can go murder people? No, that's crazy. That is crazy, okay? Because what else is under the law? Adultery is under the law. Do you think that now that you're under grace, you can go commit adultery? You know what else is under the law? Don't steal. Don't, 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 don't lie. Yes, tithing was under the law, sure, but it was actually 25 years before the law, and it shows up after the law. There are actually 41 verses in the Bible about the tithe, and over half of them don't have anything to do about the law. It has nothing to do. And eight of them are in the New Testament. And one, of the, and one of those New Testament verses, check this out, listen, it's in red letters. Oh. So I am the Lord and I don't change, he says. And this next part is funny. He says, I'm the Lord and I don't change, therefore you are not consumed. So he's saying the reason why I haven't destroyed you guys is because I don't change. That's what he's saying there. The reason I haven't consumed you and killed every single one of you is because I, the Lord, do not change. I stay merciful and forgiving or else y'all be dead. That's what he's saying here, okay? And then he says, yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances, a key word. He says, you haven't kept my ordinances. We need to talk about that word for just a minute because this word, the root word of ordinances is ordinary. And when you put the CES at the end of it, it means a principle. And what this literally means is the ordinary principle or, or an ordinary behavior principle. So what, what God is saying here is, he hasn't, he's not saying you've gone away from my laws. He's saying you've gone away from my principles of ordinary behavior. Okay, remember this passage is talking about tithing. What he's saying is tithing is an ordinary principle of behavior for my people. It's just, an, it's just an ordinary behavior for my people not to commit adultery. That's just an ordinary principle of behavior. Now, my, my people are human, and they're not perfect, and they're going to make mistakes, but it's an ordinary behavior or principle for my children not to commit adultery. It's an ordinary principle for my people not to lie. It's, it's ordinary for my people not to steal and not to kill and not to murder. It's just an ordinary principle for my people to put me first in their money. It's just an ordinary. That's what he's saying. It has nothing to do about the law. This is an ordinary behavior of God's people. It's like some of the housing ordinances that we have. Maybe there's a housing ordinance that says your lawn can't be more than two inches high. It is an ordinary principle of behavior to keep the lawn trimmed in that housing complex. That's what, that's what he's saying here, okay? God is saying it's an ordinary principle. Then he says this, return to me and I'll return to you says the Lord of hosts, and I, I kind of underline every time it says, says the Lord of hosts, because I want you to know that this is God speaking. The one who does not change is speaking, okay? But you said, in what way shall we return? Hey, well, where do we go, God? What do you mean return to you? And now God's speaking in verse eight. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And God says, in tithes and an offering. You are cursed with a curse because you've robbed me. Now, time out here for just a moment. I want you to know God's not cursing you here. That's not what he's saying. And by the way, if you don't tithe in here, like, you're not a bad person or anything. You may believe like some people do. Oh, it's under the Old Testament. It's under the law. You may believe differently. That's okay because we're all on different spectrums of faith and belief, and God is growing us and developing us, and that's okay wherever you're at in your stage and journey of faith. But what you do need to understand here is this is God's not saying, nor am I saying, that this word is not saying you're cursed. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is when you, when you do not tithe, you are putting your finances under the world economic system that is controlled by the enemy, and it is under a curse. And there is a whole different kingdom economic system that you can put your finances under that puts you under a covering of blessing. So he's saying, I'm not cursing you. You are under, you put yourself under a curse because you're choosing a world economic system instead of the kingdom economic system that actually equals a blessing in your life. How many of you seeing this with me, okay? Okay, verse 10. So he says, bring all. You know what the Hebrew word for all is? All. Yeah. <laughs> bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That's the church that there may be food in my house. And when I was reading this, I was, uh, it, what jumped out to me today is like spiritual food. I think this is not only physical food, but it's spiritual food as well. This is the law of sowing and reaping that we talked about last week. I mean, if you want to get food, if you want to get fed from the word of God and from the house of God, you need to plant seeds in the house of God. Okay, and that's one of my, honestly, one of the 
greatest compliments that, that we receive at Discovery, you receive all the time, is people say, I get fed here. I get spiritually fed here. Or people say, like, I've just grown more here than I've ever grown in my, my life. Why is that possible? Because people are planting seed in the soil, and there's food in the house of God. That's why. Okay, he says, so that there may be food in my house. And try me, or, or some translation literally means test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Now, who's talking here? Just checking. Who's talking here? Okay, God. He says, test me in this. You know, I've only heard two testimonies about tithing my whole life. There's only two testimonies. I've heard hundreds of them, but it's only two. Only two. The, the first is from those who tithe, and, and they say, we've been so blessed. That's the, that's the, we've been so blessed. In a lot of different ways, man, we're, we're blessed. And then the second testimony is from those who don't tithe, and they say, we can't afford to tithe. You, please hear me. You cannot afford to tithe until you start the tithe. Because while you're not tithing, your finances are under the world economic system controlled by the enemy and it's cursed. And you cannot afford to until you put your finances in order and start giving God what belongs to him already. Okay? Because the moment you, you'll start wanting to give to church, I promise you, your washer is going to break down. The moment you say, oh, I'm gonna, okay, I guess I'll do it. Your car is going to break down. There'll be like a bill your insurance doesn't cover or something like that. What is this happening? Because it's under a curse, I'm telling you. Because it's under a different economic system. So he says, test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out for you such what? Such blessing. blessing. That's why we're talking about it. Because all throughout the Bible, God says there is a blessing attached to what you put first on your finances. See, if I won't pour out such a blessing that there will not be room in your life to receive it. Verse, verse 11 says, and, and, that's kind of like, and if you call right now, and, that was funny. I thought it was funny. <laughs> Give the first, and he's like, and, and, I'll rebuke the devourer. Watch this. Not even for the kingdom's sakes, but for your sakes. Now, would that be all right if God rebuked the devil for you? Would that be okay if you were just standing in the room yelling at the devil that God was just like, no, 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 you back off. This one's mine. This one's under my protection. This one's under my covering. And no, no devil, no devil. He's a tither. Back off. <laughs> That's what it says. I'll rebuke the devourer, he says, for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, in other words, your income, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. One more time, who's talking here? And is it the God who cannot change? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Verse 12. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I didn't make this up. I'm just reading to you what God says. Now, Malachi chapter 3. Here's what this does. Really quickly, I'm going to throw it up on the screen because I, I got a different whole message here that I wanted to give. Tithing does three things according to Malachi 3. Put it on the screen. Tithing does three things. Tithing, according to Malachi 3, it removes the curse of the world economic system on your finances, and it puts you in a, different, in a different posture. It rebukes the devourer over your life, and it restores the blessing of God, the kingdom economic system, to your life. How many say amen to that? There you go. For those of you that are preachers or want to do a Bible study, that's your Bible study. Steal it, take it, go for it. It's not my message today. I got a different message. I want to talk to you about, about this tithe thing. Three, three things. Number one, I want you to understand, very important, tithing is a test. You got to understand this. Tithing is a test. And you take the test every time you get paid. The test is this. Whom are you going to thank for your paycheck? In other words, who are you going to worship? Because the, the person or company that gets the first portion, that first 10%, is the person or company you are thanking and worshiping for it. Because God says, the first 10% goes to my house. And by the way, he didn't need that. He doesn't do this to support his house because he can send manna from heaven and water from a rock. He doesn't need our resources. He did it, listen to me, to build your faith and to put you in a blessing so he could actually open up the windows of heaven over you. So you take this test, and God wants to see if you believe that with 90% in God's blessing, he can do more with you than 100% without it. So let's put it this way. Who do you think? Do you think Visa first? You pay Visa, you worship in Visa first. Do you pay your mortgage first? Then your mortgage is what you worship. Do you pay whatever, whatever you give first is what you worship. Who, that's, that's what, it's the principle of first. Every time I get paid, the first thing goes is Discovery Church. It's his holy tithe. 
How many get paid every week? Let me just see. How many get paid every week, every week, every week, every week? How many get paid every two weeks? Let's just, every two weeks, two weeks, a bunch of you do. How about every month? Probably a bunch of you every month, every month. How many don't even get paid? I just don't get paid. You know, there's a bunch of you. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, because if you get paid or when you get paid, for those of you that raise your hand, you're going to take the test. What do you do with the first 10%? Because we stand in church and we're like, Lord, I give you everything. Here I am. I surrender. What? 10%? No, he ain't doing the 10%. How silly is that? God, I use my life. I give you it all. Mm, I can't do 10% though. Are you kidding me? It's a test. Do you know that the number 10 in the Bible actually represents testing all throughout the Bible? That's what the number means. Biblically, the number 10, it means a test. And I'm going to prove it to you right now. I'm going to give you a whole bunch of different examples all throughout the scripture where it means a test. So let me give you some questions, and then you can answer them. I'm going to say it out loud, and then, you, and then you give me the answer. You say it out loud, okay? Here's, here's one of those occasions. How many plagues were there in Egypt? 10. Yeah, you guys are good at this. I could have asked, how many times did God test Pharaoh's heart, right? It's, it's the number of testing. How many commandments are there? 10, there you go. I'm going to ask you another question, and you may not know the answer, but there's a pattern here, you guys. You got this, all right? So how many times did God test Israel in the wilderness? 10, wow, you guys are good. That's in Numbers 14, by the way. Numbers 14, is that, that's what it says. Okay, how, how many times were Jacob's wages changed? 10, yeah, God was testing his heart. How many days was Daniel tested? 10, how many virgins were tested in Matthew 25? 10, how many days of testing are actually mentioned in Revelation chapter 2? 10, how many disciples were there? 12, I see it was a test. That was a test. <laughs> it's a test. I'm just telling you, it's a test. <laughs> Proverbs 3, got you. Verse 9 and 10, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops, then... Your barns will be filling and overflowing. Your vats will brim over with new wine. So tithing, here's what it is. God created as a test. It, the purpose is to teach you something. Put them first. He's testing you. Will you put them first? That's number one. Number two, tithing is biblical. It is biblical. Some people don't believe it's biblical. I'm going to show you a few verses. I don't have time to go through all 41, and I didn't have room to put them all written out in your notes. I just put the address of them. So let me give you a few. Genesis chapter 14 says this. Then Melchizedek king of Salem, Salem means peace, brought out bread and wine. This is the first analogy of communion in the Bible right here. And Melchizedek is a type of Christ in the Bible. He was the priest of God most high and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram, the God most high of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe. Of all. This is 500 years before the law was ever given about the tithe. Okay, and Galatians chapter 3 tells us that Abraham is our spiritual father. So, our spiritual father tied to someone who represents Jesus or was Jesus himself a Christophany, is what that's called. Theologians don't know, they're divided on that. Some believe that it was. But the book of Hebrews actually sets it up like it was Jesus because it says that Melchizedek in his genealogy had no beginning and had no end. Okay, and yet Abraham tied 500 years before the law. 420 years before the law, Jacob says this in Genesis 28, 22. This stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, God, I will give you a tenth. So Abraham and Jacob, four and 500 years before the law was ever given, they tithed. You know why? Because murder was wrong 2,500 years before the law was given when Cain killed Abel. Even though it wasn't a law yet, murder was wrong ever before the law was given. And I'm telling you, tithing was right ever before the law said it was right. Leviticus chapter 27, verse 30, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the land, belongs to the Lord. That is his. It is holy to the Lord. That word holy means it's set apart as his. It's holy. Deuteronomy chapter 26 says, when you have entered the land the Lord your God has given you, as an inheritance, that represents becoming a Christian, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, take some of the first fruits, is talking about the tithe, of all that you produce from the soil of the land, that means your income, all of your income that you produce, the Lord your God has given you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place that the Lord your God will choose 
as a dwelling for his name. Now listen to me, that's the local church. That is the place that God has chosen as the dwelling place for his name. The reason why I say this is because there's a lot of great organizations and ministries and nonprofits, but there's only one place that is for the holy set apart tithe. And that is what Jesus has established as the dwelling place of his name, his church. Amen. Verse 13. Then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the holy tithe from my house. I've done that. I set it apart for you. And also I've given them to the Levite. That's the priest, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. In other words, how the church distributes those funds in order to help people. According to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. I have not eaten any of them when in mourning. In other words, I didn't use the tithe when I had a difficult time or when I was going through something. Nor have I removed any of it for an unclean use, nor given any of it for the dead. I have obeyed your voice of the Lord God, my God, and have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people. Now, the only way you could ask God to bless you, listen to me, is when you remove the holy tithe from your house and put it in his house. That's what, Deuteron that's what we just read in Deuteronomy chapter 26. Okay, that's the only way. There is a blessing only for you if you remove what is his from your house to his house. It's his, and it belongs there. Now, let me ask you a question. If Jesus were to say, you should tithe, would you tithe? How come you didn't answer that? What's going on here? <laughs> let, me just, let me give you a second chance here, guys, okay? Because the, if Jesus, the one who died for you, bled for you, paid the way for you to have eternal life and new creation, if Jesus said, you should tithe. Would you tithe? Yes. Okay, Matthew 23, 23. He said, Jesus says, red letters here, what sorrow awaits you teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees, you guys are hypocrites for you're careful to tithe even the tiniest income for your, from your herbs and your gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. You should tithe. yes. But do not neglect the more important things. Jesus is saying here, don't think that you can just obey spiritual rules or principles and think you're getting away by not treating people like God wants you to treat them. You should obey the ordinary principles and still treat people well. That's what he, that Jesus said, you should tithe. Are you getting something out of this or you think I shouldn't have came this week because he's making sense today. Number three, tithing is personal. Now, listen, it's not personal as, oh, what I do with my money is personal. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Tithing is personal, yes, but you know who it's personal to? It's personal to Jesus. It's personal. Because he says, will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. You know, uh, if, uh, say if I, if I was going away and I asked three of you, hey, three of you guys, let's, let, I'm going away. I got to go away. I, I just need, I need you guys to take care of my wife while I'm gone, though. And I'm, I'm going to pay you a salary. I just want you to give 10% to her. Take care, take, care, take care of my bride. And I, I got to go. I got some things I need to take care of. And I'll be back. But I'll keep paying you as long as you give her 10%. And then, and then I go away just to find out that one of them did great. One of them's giving more than 10%. And one of them ain't, ain't doing much. How many of you know when I contact my wife, I'm like, baby, how are they doing? And like, oh, this one's going good, good. And this one's going above and beyond. You know, man, we need, we need to talk about, man, we need, we need to talk about Ho Jose over here, you know. <laughs> He ain't, he ain't given in three months, you know. How do you think that's going to make me feel? As, as I'm the one paying the salary. Do you know what I'm saying? All right. Now, before some of you don't like this analogy. Listen, Jesus is the one who said, I'm going away for a while. And Jesus calls his church the bride of Christ. Listen, I'm just, I'm trying to tell you that, that tithing is a lot more personal to Jesus than you actually think. That God says, you're, you're robbing me. And you're not just robbing me. You're robbing, you're robbing my people. It's not about, you, you can't really rob God. What does God mean when you say you rob me? He has it all. He owns it all. He, it's all his. So what does that mean, you're robbing me? Because it's not really about him. Check this out. Write this down somewhere. What he means is you're robbing God of the uh, opportunity to bless you and to bless others. That's what you're robbing God from. God actually wants his people blessed. And he's like, if you would just put this under the economic system of my kingdom, if you just put me first, man, not only would I bless you, but my people would be blessed, my bride would be blessed. I, this, this is the system we're supposed to be operating by. Matthew 6, 33, remember, but first, but first and most importantly, seek 
his kingdom. This is one of the principles. If you want to be blessed and live according to the kingdom of God, the blessed life, you got to understand sowing and reaping. You have to understand the principle first and put God first in every area, including your finances. I'm going to give you two more subjects on this in the next two weeks. Important areas, you got to put God first if you want, if you want the are important areas that you need to do and what you need to do to live the blessed life. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.